I would like the public to know that I am a poet first and a would-be assassin second. John Hinckley Jr. Hello, my name's Al. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a, thi a thing uh, on Cut Up, using Cut Up. Uh, I'll explain what that is now. I'd like to say thank you to Peter and Kika for, for having me um, and, uh, and, and, and for you for, for, for being here. Hello and thank you. <laughs> Cut up, a technique for creating art by cutting and editing material from pre-existing recordings. The author. Cut up is collage. Cut up is randomization. Cut up is editorship. Cut up is analysis. Cut up is mutation. It juxtaposes, annihilates, liberates, transgresses, and synchronizes. It is a technique lending its name to both process and product. It is a bold tradition within poetry, proclaiming a thoroughly enlivening an explicitly magical rearticulation of language, art, and experience. It's these three strands, language, art, and experience, that I'm hoping to interweave today uh, in, uh, the, the, this, these three strands in, in terms of lecture, poetry, and a tiny bit of reflection. Which is to say, knowledge of the craft, performance of the work, and reflexive skips, jumps, and cuts. The present work will intercut a recital of the lineage of cut up with an ancestry of radical poets, collage artists and tape mag magicians, alongside various experiments, accidents and operations. Cutting both ways, it will span the legacies of Dada and the Beats, as well as looking to the future of the practice. We will consecrate our understanding of the magical tools of cut-up, speaking of the mysteries of scissors. The patron goddess will be offered veneration. Indeed, the, the poetry I offer up will be organised, uh, hopefully, uh, by a certain element of chant uh, from, from both you uh, uh, and others allowing a certain aleatoric guiding hand to direct this devotional piece, this mosaic of fragments, this assemblage of sections, this intertwining of threads. I made you a mixtape. I hope you like it. This is an avatar of Cut Up, a descent into language magic. Cut Up is the practice of the Harrispect poet, those practitioners unafraid of getting sanguine in the sacrificed guts of texts. And as any sorcerer will tell you, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I've taken a traditional form of aleatoric manipulation here. Um, and uh, I, I leave it to the to post-structuralists amongst you to, to notice that the, the colours on this particular chatterbox have, uh, have not been coloured in, they've, they've merely the words themselves of blue, red, yellow and green. So uh, can I have a colour? Five, eleven, four, or six? Eleven. <laughs> no, why do I even look? Scissormatics. The thing with high tech is that you always end up using scissors. David Hockney. Scissors, like the human hands that operate them, are asymmetric. Their form is one of the earliest mudra we teach our children. The sign can be given for victory or banishing, the latter by legend and archer's gesture of defiance, the former in Churchill's deployment, so powerful Crowley claimed to have invented it. By flexing this sign, we cut upon the words of others to quotation. There is a North African scissor spell that will render the bridegroom unable to consummate. A child can be chided for bringing bad luck by opening and closing scissors without purpose. The crescent city sunrise from hotel pillow and dull blear insomnia hollow when you have been having that dream again, rising jerkily or half bust umbrella you open scissors and place under pillow to finally sleep, uncrossed. The two blades can be considered the joining of the atama and the bowline. In the language of tarot, the twin arms are a concordance of the attributes of Gemini, the twins, and Zane, the sword, to Atu Six, the lovers. Saturn's sickle, tau, cuts son from mother. The two arms are reflexive, paired opposites of the hallways of Horus and the tunnels of Set. Scissors certainly serve with both hands. The double arms, paired like lips and compasses, are a celebration of the double current, from Libra and two of swords depicting an emanation of Mart and demonstrating that peace can be a result of the union of strength 
and truth. Scissors speak of the mysteries of pivot, lever, and fulcrum. A cut, in mechanical terms, is said to be an application of shear stress at a cut location which exceeds a material shear strength. Shear stress is represented in the mechanic formulae that describe cutting with the 19th letter of the Greek alphabet, also a tau, a symbol of life and resurrection, reminding us that cut up is, in some ways, an enacting of Assyrian birth, rebirth mysteries and of, in an amnesiac sense, remembering. A couple of brief uh, accounts of the use of scissors in magic uh, that I'd like to offer you. Um, first, I've sort of, first type of them I've, I've sort of uh, titled safety scissors. Uh, this is uh, your, your, your idea of scissors used uh, as, a, as a protective ward uh, for, for your house uh, above, uh, above doorways or, or portals uh, uh, and liminal spaces. Um, if you put a pair of scissors under your pillow, open with the points to the head of the bed, no one can harm you or bewitch you. Uh, something similar can be done with an open Bible at uh, Psalm 121 with a pair of open scissors uh, placed under a bed. Um, the idea of Psalm 121 obviously being a, uh, a protective uh, psalm, it, it, it speaks of the, the God of Israel watching over us as you sleep and he will not sleep. Uh, there's also uh, a sort of thing about the sun and moon in there, so there's a, 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 a duality there for an enterprising uh, operator. Uh, if a pair are hidden under a doormat, uh, anyone wishing you ill uh, will be incredibly uncomfortable in your home. Um, having said safety scissors, scissors safety, uh, if you're offered uh, scissors as a gift, uh, traditionally uh, it is uh, germane and, and proper etiquette to, to, to give uh, uh, some form of uh, payment for them, lest the scissors cut the love between you. Uh, this is a, a very old practice in terms of uh, uh, bladed objects. Uh, we've got uh, examples of it, uh, references from uh, 1507 and 1611 uh, that relate to knives in this context, but there's a, there's a, a letter uh, from a, one uh, Elizabeth Wentworth uh, dated uh, February 1707 uh, to her brother, where she uh, gives a great thanks for the scissors you sent me by Mr. Shockman. I gave him sixpence for fear that it cut the love on one side, but for mine it is well grounded to fear as another scissors as a knife that cuts it. Um, there's also a, a, a belief of uh, dropping scissors. Uh, if, if you drop scissors, it's, it's said that uh, someone else should have to pick them up for you. Uh, this is uh, something that, a, a piece of folklore that we, we find in, in various other kinds of bladed objects as well. And uh, if one drops scissors uh, outside and they stick in the ground, it's uh, meant to signify either a death or a birth or a marriage or all three. And as we'll see, that isn't necessarily an ambiguity, but something of the essential nature of scissors, perhaps. Uh, the second kind of magic I want to talk about is uh, cosinomancy. Uh, this is uh, known as the, the, uh, the shears and sieve uh, uh, technique. It's, uh, it's a way of uh, discerning guilt, uh, specifically for thief detection in uh, uh, cunning craft of the early modern period. Uh, quote, the sieve helps finding the thief. The gypsy scissors are thrust unbound in the sieve. One woman holds one, part, one of the two parts of the scissors in her fingers and another woman the other part. All the suspicions upon the thief are said. One of the women represents the good side. She says that X is not a thief, he did not steal, and the other represents the bad part, saying that X, Y, or Z are thieves. When the sieve moves strongly, it means that the thief is found. Uh, there is an accompanying spoken component, uh, a riddle of, of, of various different sorts. One of these riddles uh, from, from Agrippa's incantation to compel the spirits to work runs, Dies mies jesiet benedoethet doema entiatamaus. There's a record of its use in the uh, north of England in the 16th century that I'm, I'm happy to talk about in more detail uh, afterwards if anyone's interested, but it involves uh, um, an Alice Swan uh, uh, making, uh, for turning the riddle and shears with certain others uh, upon the minister after the, the Sunday sermon, uh, a, a potent review perhaps of, of the minister. Um, the, the, the other form of, uh, of, of scissor magic I'd, I'd like to briefly talk about is, uh, is a, a hoodoo formula uh, known as cut and clear. Uh, to quote uh, Catherine Ironwood, Cut and Clear is a hoodoo formula for oil, incense, and sachet powders and washing products that are designed to separate people from difficult relationships or bad habits by breaking ties to the past. They can be used to get over a failed love affair or a period of bad luck so you can stop obsessing over what might have been and happily meet the better future that's in store for you. The symbolism on the label is clear. A pair of scissors to cut ties to the past and a rising sun to symbolize the bright possibilities for happiness that lay ahead. 
One of the main components of uh, cut and clear is uh, lemon, and occasionally lemongrass as well, uh, yellow colouring uh, also. Uh, a black candle and a white candle are used to represent two aspects of the situation, significantly the past and the future. Again, we have scissors looking both ways. And a lemon or lemon-scented herb or conjure oil and a pair of scissors to represent cutting apart the connection between the two aspects. Cut and clear spells are about severing ties. They're also about forgetfulness to a certain extent, uh, about getting rid of and bringing in the new and better. And in, in that way, they, they, they bear some resemblance to another yellow oil, uh, Van Damme. Uh, they're also about keeping the good and jettisoning the bad. Um, and that's sort of accompanied by, or sort of illustrated by the accompanying charm or spoken component of using them, which runs, cut and clear, cut and clear, I'll keep the things that I hold dear. Pulling a riot out of a hat. I'm getting poetry off the page. I created poems in the air when I tore up a dictionary to pull the words out of a hat and scatter them like confetti. Tristan Zara. The genealogy of Cutter, we thought to begin with Dada, and specifically with one of the founder anti-artists, Romanian Aries Sammy Rosenstock, better known by his legally assumed magical name, Tristan Zara. Moving to Zurich in 1915, Zara became involved with a milieu of artists, poets and anarchists that gathered around the Cabaret Voltaire. It was here Zara began his engagement with Dada, making radical attacks on the formalism and elitism of contemporary poetry. By late 1919, Zara had moved to Paris to work on the magazine Literature with André Breton. It was here that Zara would eventually be barred from the Dada movement by Breton, partly, if the legends are to be believed, for advocating Cutter. It is claimed Zara took to the stage at a gathering and proposed to recite a spontaneous poem by pulling words out of a hat. It is also claimed that his act was so revolutionary that the crowd promptly rioted. After the initial rushing high of Cabaret Voltaire, and before the full-on come-down of disagreements and excommunications, Zara put out his Dado Manifesto on feeble love and bitter love of 16 parts in Francis Picabia's 391 magazine on the 12th of December, 1920. At the heart of this manifesto is a vital call to scissor arms, which you can find in the essay. Not only does this call mark one of the first instances of the cut-up method's description, it could well be used as a sacred source for further exegesis of personal practice. From the anti-establishment movement described by Carl Jung as too idiotic to be schizophrenic, a profoundly simple technique emerged, a technique sufficiently basic, egalitarian, and satisfying enough to be performed swaying in kitchens, drunkenly pushing around fridge magnets. With bus tickets in its collages, the cut-up of Dada celebrates the art and magic in and of the everyday. Whether pulled by chance or rearranged with intention, we can consider the individual word cutting as the elementary root of cut up, its crowning distillation, as well as its initial manifestation. As a piece of personal reflection on Dada, um, I'd, I'd like to offer this little time skip. As I'm sorting through historical details and various quotations from and on the poets, artists and writers referenced in the essay I'm sampling from, I'm listening to Uncle Bill Burroughs being interviewed on his birthday in 1984. The interview will be broadcast five days later, exactly one year before the birth of the best friend and colleague who will introduce me to Spider Totems, The Invisibles and the work of Jeff Noon. The first time I meet Johnny at a party where we get talking because he's wearing a particularly psychedelic Sandman t-shirt, I unwittingly make a pun on his surname. Everyone laughs. I don't know Johnny's surname at this point, uh, but like any enterprising magician, I take credit for my happy accidents. Johnny and I begin making cut-up poems together almost as soon as we meet. It's exactly like we've done it before. Our third mind is an entity masquerading as a two-handed performance poetry project we initially titled The Blue Screen of Dada, eventually shortening this to simply blue screen and, occasionally in fits of self-deprecation and or despair, simply BS. The rituals and the results are simple, profound, baffling and hilarious. Word lists are generated from popular science texts, recipes, newspapers, holy books, magazines. The words are put into a dedicated and consecrated baseball cap, dice are rolled, and that number of individual words are pulled from the hat, arranged in order of appearance, before finally a minimum of grammar is injected to bypass the anti-nonsense firewall immune systems of listeners. The resultant creations are committed to memory and still used to workings to this day.
Give me a colour. Six or four? Six. Six thinking masks. I love this one. So, <clears throat> cup isn't just about division. It cuts apart and it joins up. Solve and coagula. As a result, when we start thinking about fragments put together again, we inevitably come to the idea of compilation and of mixtape. It's one of my favourite things. And I get to be a little bit of a superhero. When we're considering nothingness, haiku are very good, very useful. Supposedly, speaking of an image of change, something similar, and something eternal. I wrote a haiku about something that happened to a friend of mine. It runs, uh, I have deleted my recycle bin and now don't know where it's gone. <laughs> um, I suppose just, yeah. Right. So I really like mixtapes. And uh, I decided to write a poem about mixtapes, uh, about compilations. Um, but I decided to make it a compilation of approaches to mixtapes. So this is six different approaches to mixtapes brought together, including this one, explaining it. We are gathered here to give praise to almighty mixtape. The skillfulness of arranging flowers, the laughter of the cabaret. Effect through difference, strength through comparison. Thinking around a subject with a collective essay editorship. A unity of the separate into a whole new something. The magician's top hat, a variety show, like why not? Surprise party pieces and more than the sum of the parts. And you leave it to the next mask to cite facts. And the next mask. Fact. Jeffrey O'Brien has described the mixtape as possibly the most widely practiced Western art form. Fact. Homemade mixtapes became popular in the 1980s. Fact. One important distinction between homemade mixtapes and retail compilations is that the latter generally obtain the use of copyright, while the former do not. Fact. The word canto comes from the Latin, meaning cloak made of patches. Fact. The word anthology comes from the Greek word for a garland of flowers. But six blind men describe six different elephants depending on the area of the animal's body they're reporting from. You run in the risk of clip shows and the greatest trash anthems repackaged for whatever mandatory card they sells best. Frankenstein's clown shoes, hodgepodge puts elitists and complete us off, the previous colours, the palette, and too much cinema pick and mix eaten in the dark gives you a headache. But, my intuitive gut reaction is firmly in favour of a myriad of samples in any combined flavour. My favourite bands play at least two styles in duck genre, and it really gives two tugs of their dogs cock about copyright sometimes. They're all about being the best gifts to give and to get and to share stuff like goosebumps, sweat shivers and back of the neck tingles. Like reality as a mishmash and so are your mood swings and juxtaposition can feel truest to life. Alright? And so a one-man show is an arrangement of characters played sequentially through an actor pretending to be a gramophone. Actually, let's do that Scottish play's witchcraft scenes, or what do I want to be played in my funeral? Harmonies of moods to order. Maybe this solar system is the universe compiling itself, you know, with an all-important lively third track, while your psychologies and cabalas structure human experience like the Yi Ching is a 64-part symbolism mix on random. Like energy imbalance manifestation comes to cloud formations recorded over a lazy afternoon. Yeah, frame those rainbows. Programming our photo albums, memory playback functions. Archetypically speaking, any story is mixtape. After all, 
mixes are even made from simultaneous fragments now, all the way down to the genome sequence. We all dance at the wedding receptions. It's valid even as a medium. And in conclusion, my escape pod will never play lift music. Thank you. Exploding tickets. Curbs establish new connections between images, and one's range of vision consequently expands. Most people don't see what's going on around them. That's my principal message to writers. For God's sake, keep your eyes open. William S. Burroughs. And so we come to the very fathers of the term cut-up, the patron saints of sundered newspapers and doctored recordings, Brian Geisen and William Burroughs. Once more, the setting is Paris now the cold spring of 1958. Anglo-Canadian artist Geisen, an American Aquarian and soon-to-be former heroin addict Burroughs, are living in a Class 13 hotel at Neuf Rue Gilles Lecour in the Latin Quarter. The flop house Gregory Corso will dub the Beat Hotel. The Occupy Room, number 15, where Geisen would later recall Burroughs, scotch taping his photos together into one great continuum on the wall where scenes faded and slipped into one another. This room was the location for the birth of Cut-Up as we know it now. Number 15 by the Kabbalah of the Sefer Yetzer, of course, being the number of the constituting eye, the intelligence that composes and combines to form holes. While cutting out a mount for a drawing, Geisen began rearranging the scraps into which the Stanley knife had happened to slice the backing newspaper. These arrangements, collaged from scraps, what Geisen calls the raw words, would later appear as first cut-ups in the collaborative work minutes to go. Returning the following year from kicking his habit in London, Burroughs quickly started experimenting with the technique. By the Parisian summer of 1960, he had begun a lifelong engagement with cut-up as a writing process. Over the course of this engagement, he would elucidate several theoretical positions on the power and efficacy of cut-up. Most obviously, Burroughs expounded a basic idea of the mechanical nature of practicing cut-up, an approach that formed a strongly egalitarian challenge to the elitisms of the art world. Burroughs remarked that he found it, quote, much easier to get interest in the cut-ups from people who are not writers, doctors, lawyers, or engineers, any open-minded, fairly intelligent person, than from so-called serious writers. In a 1965 interview, he elaborated, most serious writers refuse to make themselves available to the th things that technology is doing. I've never been able to understand that sort of fear. Many of them are afraid of tape recorders, and the idea of using any mechanical means for literary purposes seems to them some sort of sacrilege. This is one objection to the cut-ups. There's been a lot of that, a sort of superstitious reverence for the word. My God, they say, you can't cut up these words. Why can't I? There is a profound sharpness of transgression, of iconoclasm, of independent thought present in both the approach and practice of cut-up. This anti-elitist sentiment would have no doubt resonated strongly with Geisen, whose youthful hopes as an artist had been dashed on the day of the preview of the young man's first exhibition alongside Duchamp, Magritte, and many of the others in 1935, when André Breton had, for reasons best known to himself, expelled the 19-year-old Geisen from the Surrealist group. Burroughs' charge of technophobia on the part of many staid and methodologically conservative writers also evokes the shade of criticism of the work of fellow beat writer Jack Kerouac, exemplified by Truman Capote's infamous dismissal, and I'm not going to do the voice, it isn't writing at all, it's typing. Despite, or indeed because of this, the mechanical dimensions of the process, Burroughs is eager to ensure the writer as editor still plays a central role in the creative endeavor. Quote, somebody has to program the machine. Somebody has to do the cutting up. Remember that I first made the selections. Out of hundreds of possible sentences that I might have used, I chose one. The primacy of choice, of willed intervention and effect is clear in this emphasis on selection. Another of Burroughs' approaches to the philosophy of cut-up is centred around the notion of variation, the notion that rearrangement allows a reader to explore many available options presented by the text. Quote, any narrative passage or any passage, say, of poetic images is subject to any number of variations, all of which may be interesting and valid in their own right. A page of Rimbaud cut up and rearranged gives you quite new images. Rimbaud images, real Rimbaud images, but, but new ones. Burroughs did just this 
collaborating with Gregory Corso to produce cups from Rimbaud's poetry. And this practice clearly presented a radically different attitude to authorship, originality and plagiarism, and one that would be echoed in later lawsuits over music sampling. Such concern with variation can also be considered a theoretic accompaniment to the practice of Geisen's permutation poems, a writing form he himself devised in which several, if not all, of the possible arrangements of the words in a sentence are presented in a sequence, exploring the possibilities inherent in a set of words removed from their original place in a linear construction. For example, on cut up, cut upon, cut on up. The similarities between this and magical permutation of sacred words should neither be overlooked nor assumed to be forcing the connection. Michael Goss has pointed out how Geissen not only conceived of much of his painting as plain and simple results magic, but actually used techniques for constructing magical objects to produce his paintings, particularly taking inspiration from one Moroccan curse amulet he had discovered in his restaurant in Tangiers. Some of these permutation poems were also composed in part using early computer randomization algorithms in collaboration with Ian Somerville, who would also work with Geissen in the creation of the Dream Machine, a stroboscopic device for inducing visionary experiences which can be constructed using a turntable. In the case of permutation poetry, the development of cut-up primarily concerns the number of iterated novelties presented. Again, we have the effect of editorial will being exercised upon existent texts to create new compositions, cut-up becoming the locus of both Geissen's novelty and Burroughs' novels. This pursuit of novelty boils down to the culmination cultivation of the ability to read things in diverse ways, to occupy different perspectives, to trace hidden interconnections, to pursue the expansion of consciousness into fresh and enlivening vistas. It is an intensely magical practice. The sheer experiential efficacy of Cut Up relies in part on the technique that models the very processes occurring in our interaction with, in, and as the universe. No experience occurs in isolation. There is a continuum of juxtaposing texts of exopsychic and endopsychic experience to be read in any one phenomenological instance. Let us allow Uncle Bill to explain just how far this conception of cut-up goes. Cut-ups make explicit a psychosensory process that is going on all the time anyway. Somebody is reading a newspaper and his eye follows the column in the proper Aristotelian manner, one idea and sentence at a time. But subliminally, he is reading the columns on either side and is aware of the person sitting next to him. That's a cut-up. I was sitting in a lunchroom in New York having my donuts and coffee. I was thinking that one does feel a little boxed in New York, like living in a series of boxes. I looked out the window and there was a great big Yale truck. That's cut up, a juxtaposition of what's happening outside and what you're thinking of. What I'd like to pull out of, of that approach to it is this notion that awareness itself uh, becomes scissors throwing fragments onto the cutting room floor of attention. Experiencing is cutting. It was not simply aggrandizement that led Burroughs to declare that all writing was cut up, the deepest and most basic of writing, the phenomenological writing of the world in our heads is cut up. Bringing together the mechanical, the egalitarian, the metamorphic, the radical, and the innovative aspects of cut up is the nativity story of room 15. The element of almost accidental discovery of the cut up technique by Geissen not only brings to mind the origin myths of countless scientific epiphanies and insights, but also speaks to a very basic truth there is magic anywhere and in anything. It must only be noticed, arranged, patchworked, engaged with. The newspaper becomes the cutting board, becomes the input, becomes cut up. When I was writing this, I spent the entire day in my room and didn't talk to anyone and was writing. And, uh, became uh, a bit stir-crazy and uh, had, a, had a phone call uh, from a, a friend to go to a, a party. A bunch of people I didn't know um, met this friend, went to this party, walked into the kitchen. Uh, midway through conversation about the frustrations I was having trying to explain what I was getting at with Burroughs to find 20 strangers in a kitchen balancing apples on their heads. <laughs> it's at this point that my friend turned around and pointed to the fridge magnet uh, uh, words on the, on, on the fridge and went, that. Uh, what have we got left? Hmm. Heads or tails? Tails. <laughs> oh. oh, conflict. Tails. 
Tails. Tails it is. Paired like lips. Any fragment, any tangle, any scrapbook, any switch, any cutting can be cousined, and all the thread that's bare will stitch. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. We leave our pieces trailing wakeward, moments spent and snipped. A collage of co-happen snaps, as all we are is shared in strips. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. The crashing waves and rolling planes, for there is noise and there is script, all the mess and meaning mingled and every chimera you dare to wish. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. By scales and crown and awful shears, the terrible that tears and rips, the threads of life fine spun for us, attached and mortal and scared to bits. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. The broken egg, the Y and X, genetic record two-strand twist, the tiny spirals writhe extending, rungs of laddering, the stairs that shift. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. The burning sun and chalk dust moon, lovers, twins and human limbs, expansive and receptive, lungs, compasses, pupils, wings, and the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. And we may cast to newly shuffled, chips and morsels, pick and mix, let the clippings take their root, with all your doubting cares dismissed. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. Yet to grasp the loopholes and clutch to tooth mold in lung flex finger fits the guts and blood severity for what may run, beware their grip. And the scissor blades of fate, they are paired like lips. For any story, any breathing, all allotted shares of fill. Come to know how ending feels, and mouth a prayer as farewell kiss. For the scissor blades of fate may have paired like lips. Dubwise in the speech of serpents. We need writers who revel in the wild excitement of language at this deepest level. Jeff Noon. There is one final magician to be paid homage in this litany, one further significant development to be honoured in the lineage of cut-up poesis, that of the English writer Jeff Noon. Noon has written science fiction novels, plays and short stories, but it is a single, slightly more unclassifiable work published in 2001, which I believe secures his place in this tradition. Cobra Lingus, a short tome best described as a grimoire of language magic, illuminates the Cobralingus engine, a collection of imaginary technologies that applies the concepts and production techniques of electronic music, and specifically dub music, to writing. Dub has a magic all of its own. Uh, the word itself is suggested by John Cobbett uh, to come from uh, the Jamaican patois term duppy, uh, a ghost. Uh, this seems to be suggest, uh, supported by the explanation offered by seminal dub producer Lee Scratch Perry that dub is nothing less than the ghost in me coming out. The haunting reverbs and spectral delays pioneered by Caribbean sound engineers and musicians of the late 1960s, ghostly accompaniments to long deep throbs of bass, provide Noon with a particularly appropriate historical and creative model with which to explain the Cobalingus engine. At the roots of dub is the creation of new variations through the manipulation and recombination of various complementing and juxtaposing tracks or recordings. Dub, like our experiencing of the world, is effects heavy. Noon elaborates. Imagine a musical signal traveling along a pathway. The signal passes through various gates or filters, each of which has its own effect on the music. These effects might include distort, echo, overload, and so on. Described like this, it sounds a very cold, mechanical operation. In fact, the music created in this way often reveals an astonishing ruined beauty. The idea behind the Cobalingus project is quite simple. 
Could a piece of text be pushed along a similar pathway? In other words, the basic editorial techniques of cutting up recorded material, whether that be notebooks, newspapers, or tape loops, have been extended into the digital world of production software. And as legions of bedroom producers and DJs will attest, the options open to the manipulation of a WAV file are far broader than those of scissors and glue upon paper. For Cobra Lingus, the writer, the dead, in inert physical text is resurrected as a shifting, living spirit of information. It's through this approach that words become a liquid medium, a malleable substance capable of being transformed in surprising ways, drops of mercury scattered and reformulating in a linguistic alchemy of alteration and evocation. The centrality of transformation sums up both the place of Cobra Lingus within the cut-up tradition and neatly illustrates its fresh contribution. Permutation has become mutation, and the mechanical has become the electronic. Such a development can arguably be seen in the auguries of authorial interjections that were already occurring in cut-up. Those compensations for dismembered words and other analogue glitches, gaps from out of which the innovation and willed intent of the editor-creator can and did manifest. The wheel continues to turn, now emphasising the manipulation of text by choices and imaginative exercises of the author. An exegesis in excision. De-emphasising aleatoric elements. And these filter gates such as decay and explode cut away, whereas others such as enhance, control and find story have a, quote, more constructive property of bringing together. This combination of solve and coagula in Cobolingus is no clearer than in Noon's idea of killing a text and summoning its ghost. This poetic necromancy empowers the most destructive actions of cut-up to be understood as a process of alchemical death, as a deeply transformative act. Similarly, the ghost of the text is not bound to the physical page, line or word. It haunts the feeling, the meaning, the experience of the reading by a silvery thread spun from the language craft of the writer. This Holy Spirit is likewise transformed, but with the inspired breath of a creative imagination, rather than by the scissor-jawed winds of death and chance. Noon refers to the transformations of text using the Cobra engine as a process of metamorphiction, uh, and further outlines his notion of filter gates for text by saying that words can be stretched, broken, melted, drugged, mutated, forced into submission, set free. Liberation, vicissitude, transgression and creation through destruction of writing, of reading and of meaning are still key themes. And yes, Noon's imaginary technologies of metamorph fiction do indeed extend to linguistic pharmacology, dosing text with philological wonder drugs, metaphorazine, anagrammathine, fecundamol. So be warned, there are people going around drugging words and we're encouraging you to join us. I'm nine years old, and my best friend Edward is playing me a tape his older brother has given him. The following year, Edward's father will get an academic position in Glasgow, and he and his family will move far away. One sleep overnight, we are taking turns waiting for the other to fall asleep, before waking them up by putting a talking action figure next to their ear. The action figure is Venom from the Spider-Man comics. It has a couple of buttons on the back that play two villainous threats. The rather uninspired, Die Spider-Man, and the second, uh, I want to eat your brain. Um, I, can, I, I honestly can still hear it now. We delight in repeating these two statements over and over and over again into the wee small hours. A best friend, spiders, poison, dream. Uh, this is my first experience of anything resembling either electronic looping or trance states.
the Lady of the Awful Shears. Practically all poets sing of the three fates. Marsilio Ficino. Atropos, sister of Clotho and Lachesis, daughter of night, wet nurse to the muses, last of the fates, a scroll, a wax tablet, a sundial, a pair of scales, a cutting instrument, staffs or scepters, sometimes even crowns, shears, scissors, thread, text, threes, black, white, grey, purple, deep, dark blue, wine, cuts, breaks, remix, compilation, mixtape, exquisite corpse, composition, decomposition, transformation, charm craft, sorcery and root work as assemblage, spell bags, packets, hands, cuttings, the solve, pillar of severity, time, prophecy, birth and the future. Hesiod in the shield of Heracles says, Clotho and Lachesis stood over them, and smaller than they was Atropos, no tall goddess, yet she it is who is eldest of them, and ranked high beyond the two others. She is the minister to the queen of the underworld, yet Plutarch seats her in the sun, governing the origin of birth. Veiled in black, she sings of the future. Her devotees are prophets and seers. She lends her name to the extract or essence of belladonna, the tropane alkaloid atropine, shared by most nightshades. It is germane she should be honoured in a collection bearing the name of a fellow Solancia. And after all, the word anthology still comes from the Greek for a garland of flowers. I'd like to end with, with a poem. Um, it's... Uh, hopefully addressing the other thing that poets are meant to talk about, which is the heart. Um, I wrote it partly for my sister, who loves jigsaws, um, and uh, I, I wanted to end it here uh, for, for, for that. Uh, it's called Take Heart. It should be fairly obvious. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for having me. The cardiac attests to the tessellating nature of the puzzle nestled in your chest, which is not a problem, but a toy. Every girl and or boy born with an infinity piece set ready to intertwine. And life can be the key that opens that which interlocks, interdigitating, interlacing moments of experiential integration. Yeah, puzzle pieces get everywhere. That big four dimensional jigsaw, harmony. Because there's fun to be had in the guessing of what's made of more than the sum of the tiny parts. But knowing you won't know the whole of it due to the segments you've given away of your heart. Then I'll make up someone else's arrangement to consciously live as an ongoing collage. The swapping and changing of fleeting identity is in of itself a work of art. So you've got spaces, full to bursting with emptiness, making room for human engagement. Stasis is a negation of dynamic creative and I don't believe in perfect. I want to exist in a continuous, wide-ranging collection of morsels. Completion is used up and worked out. Let's be unfinished, not over and done with. So flow like an octopus, with the stone of the philosopher snuggled under your lungs, transmuting base to a golden consciousness, a trial by fire, a reconciling of opposites, a genie in a bottled relationship, unstoppered. Heart-stringed orchestras will echo through your atria. Make donation of your unused shards to strangers. In the name of paper chain golems with love under their tongues and the scissors that shape them, holding open arms, take heart.